Our lecture today is going to be about Edward Manet and the beginnings of modernism. Now, modernism is a new term for us, and it's all about a new approach of seeing and representing the world. Art is beginning to break from past traditions established during the Renaissance. Techniques such as linear perspective and chiaroscuro, thought to be so vital to a successful artist, we begin to look away and not follow these conventions anymore. It's really important for you to know who the father of modern art is, and it is Edward Manet. But don't confuse Edward Manet with Claude Monet. I know their names are very close together. They're only one letter apart. And what makes things worse is these two individuals live at the same time and they knew each other and they were friends. But this lecture is going to focus on Manet. You're also going to hear the term avant-garde for the artworks we're going to discuss in this lecture. And it's going to depend which class you're in. If you're in my intro to art classes, we're only going to talk about modern art for a day or two. If you're in one of my survey classes, we're going to talk about it for the rest of the semester. And if you're taking my history of modern art class, we talk about it the entire semester. So avant-garde deals with artists from the modern age. And we consider not only the artist avant-garde, but the work that they produce. Their work is ahead of their time. It's innovative, it's revolutionary, and it's experimental. And so here's the guy we're gonna talk about today, Edward Manet. As you can see from his birth and death dates, he doesn't have a very long life, only lives until he's 51 years old. Manet came from an affluent background. He traveled extensively throughout Europe, visiting Germany, Holland, Spain, and also Italy, and he visited Italy several times. And this, of course, is the Mecca of art. Not only do we have art from the Renaissance, but we have art from the ancient Roman civilization. This is a person who attended law school for a while and ended up dropping out. Then he served as a naval cadet, and he also dropped out of that. But we're most interested in the six years that he'd studied at the Academy de Beaux-Arts in Paris. And he met with very early success as a painter there. And with this work here, the Spanish singer, this was accepted into the Salon of 1861. And this was a big deal really for any artist. So I need to tell you a little bit about what a Salon is and how important it is. This is an event, or even more of an exhibition, really, held every year by the Académie de Beaux-Arts in Paris. And here, the very best artwork from the most talented students was put on display for the public to see. And the Salon was an extremely popular event. Everyone went to it. Male, female, young, old, rich or poor, you went to the Salon. It's kind of like a county fair if you lived in the Midwest. It was something you attended. The location where the salon is held is at the Louvre. And this is the Richelieu wing of the Louvre, and this is where you would find the salon. The salon is not at all like a museum or gallery experience. These paintings are placed frame to frame, very tight quarters, no didactic labels around them telling you who the artist is or what the title of this work is or what you're supposed to take away from it. When we look at the paintings at the lower reaches, we're, we see that they are smaller and the subject matter for these works are going to be portraiture, still life, landscape, and genre scenes. Genre scenes are scenes from everyday life. When we look at the larger paintings, they're usually up further on the wall. And the subject matter of these paintings are going to be mythology, religion, and history. 
those subject matters were thought to be the most important and they were also reserved for the very best of the best students. This painting by Manet did not meet with the same critical success as the previous one I showed you. This was rejected from the Salon of 1862. But Manet was also someone who was very interested in Spanish society, and he did a lot of works in terms of bullfights and subject matters like that. He was obsessed with Spain. He did go on vacation one time to Spain. He went for 10 days in the fall of 1865, and he absolutely hated it. He then returned to Paris. Another early work of Manet's is The Absinthe Drinker. And this is a real person who lived. His name was Collardet and he hung around the Louvre. But this painting disturbed people because it showed the results of absinthe drinker that were just beginning to be common in French society. This drink had this brain rotting quality and we can see the figure here looking blankly off into the distance. But of Manet's important paintings, the number one painting he's responsible for is Le Déjeuner Célèbre. This painting you'll need to know by its English translation, Luncheon on the Grass. And this is a painting that was shown to the Salon of 1863. Here it is at the Louvre today. And the Salon of 1863 is one of those pivotal points in art history where we start to make that transition from all those techniques that were important in the past to a much more open modernist style of art. So Manet brings this painting into the Salon to hang it on the wall. And in order for you to be approved to have your artwork hung in the Salon, it has to go through a jury, usually of about five individuals, that give it the thumbs up or the thumbs down in terms of quality. If you get the thumbs up, you get to hang your painting in the salon. Unfortunately for Manet, his painting was rejected. And here is his rejection letter, which basically tells him his painting is awful and does not meet the academic qualities that the school is looking for. This year, 1863, over 3,000 works of art are rejected from the Salon. And this is a big deal. So the Minister of Art goes over to the office of Napoleon III, who is the King of France. And this is the nephew, some say the illegitimate son of Napoleon Bonaparte. And they discuss the issue and Napoleon comes up with a solution which basically says we're going to have two salons this year. We're going to have the regular salon, but we're also going to have a salon of the refuse, the salon de refuse. And this is where Luncheon on the Grass gets being placed in the public view, and the Paris art world is never going to be the same again. Now, when we look at Luncheon on the Grass, by today's standards, the painting is pretty tame, and most of my students comment that the reason it got kicked out of the salon was because there was a nude female sitting there with two dressed males. And that is not at all the correct answer as to why this painting was rejected from the salon. More importantly, the nude female is painted poorly. It's lacking semitones the technique of chiaroscuro is absent here. We also have a disassociation between the background and the foreground. The narrative is unclear. We don't know if the woman waiting in the water in the background is part of this group or not. The entire scene is rather flat. And for the first time in 400 years, we are disregarding the rules of linear perspective. We also have visible brushstrokes. 
which normally they should be blended into a painting, but unfortunately they are not visible on this slide. And finally, the painting itself is gigantic. It's roughly seven feet by eight foot. The size of a history painting, religion, or mythological scene, but instead it's a genre scene. It should roughly be about a foot and a half by two feet. But what really disturbed everyone the most was that the individuals in this painting, the men are dressed in contemporary clothing. So this is not a painting of the past, which is what painting was really about. It was about what happened before. But now we're looking at a very contemporary, a very modern scene. Although this painting does have its roots in paintings from the past. This is a Renaissance painting by the artist Giorgione, and this is called Pastoral Concert, which you see at the right, where we have two nude females with two dressed males in a very similar scene. And this is a painting that Manet would have seen as he was a student at the Louvre. That's where this painting was. And look at the individuals in the bottom right-hand side of this engraving. And this is an engraving after a painting that no longer exists by Raphael. And those three individuals are in the same sitting position as the people in Manet's painting. So Manet definitely references not only the past, but important artists, Giorgione and Raphael, as the basis for this painting. And even in contemporary days, we see this album cover recreating Manet's famous painting. Now, when we look back in time to 1863 and ask who the most important artist is, this name comes up again and again, Ernest Meissonier. And normally when we look at the history of art, this is a name today that is never spoken and it's never mentioned in the history books. We think about the groundbreaking artists such as Manet, Monet, Degas, Van Gogh, Mary Cassatt. No one talks about Meissonier, but this individual had won every single artistic award available to him in France. Napoleon III ran out of awards and ended up naming a street after him the Rue Meissonnier, and this incensed this artist. His friends didn't understand why he didn't like this really great honor, and Meissonnier just replied, I demand a boulevard. That's how much this artist not only thought of himself, but truly how important he was to the fabric of art in France during this age. He had the most expensive painting ever sold in France during the 19th century at 860,000 francs. Comparing that to Van Gogh's only painting he sold, he sold that painting for 400 francs. So there's a vast difference in terms of how much money this artist was receiving for his work. Friedland today stands in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and the person who purchased this work was Alexander T. Stewart, who was an American dry goods millionaire. In fact, the mansion that he lived in, his address today would be the Empire State Building. Alexander T. Stewart's mansion was bulldozed to put the Empire State Building in its place. That's how much money this gentleman had and how wealthy he was. Unfortunately, he died about two weeks after taking possession of this painting. And this guy is also famous today because after his death, his body was body snatched and his wife paid roughly $25,000 to get the body back. The thieves should have stolen the painting instead of the corpse. But there is a fairly famous book uh, written about Alexander T. Stewart. It's called, I believe, The Merchant Prince. But moving back to my Sonia, this is a person who no one would have ever dreamed of would be a forgotten artist. 
The French artist Delacroix said, after we're all long dead and forgotten, my Sagne is still going to reign supreme. And really that doesn't happen. Within 10 years of my Sagne's death, he is airbrushed out of the history of art. It would be as incredible as us forgetting Picasso by the mid 1980s. In this Napoleonic battle scene, which Maissonnier was famous for creating. Maissonnier is the self-portrait of Napoleon, and these battle scenes were staged on Maissonnier's estate at Poissy. One last thing we need to consider also about Maissonnier's paintings is the overall size of them. They're about the size of a license plate on a car, and if you were wealthy enough to own one of these, you would sit with it on your lap with a magnifying glass to marvel at all the details that are present here. It is said that this guy could capture more detail than a camera could. He would paint with one horsehair attached to the brush. We're gonna fast forward a couple of years to 1865 and see Olympia. And this is a painting also by Edward Manet this time it gets accepted into the salon, but again causes a scandal. And Olympia is a name given to prostitutes of that time. And that is exactly what this is a painting of. When it was unveiled, women were said to have shrieked at the sight of it, and men threatened to beat it off of the wall with their walking sticks. A constable had to be situated next to the painting in order to protect it. But there was also a constable in front of Maissonnier's paintings at the salon in order to help the people, the flow of people around the work. But this is another painting that is based on very important Renaissance works. The artist Titian, who was actually the pupil of Giorgione, who gave us pastoral concert, created this work also in the 1500s called the Venus of Urbino. And this is also a painting of a prostitute, a courtesan for the Duke of Urbino. But when we compare and contrast these two images, they are very similar in terms of the stance of the two women. However, the one on the right, you have more curvilinear line compared to the one on the left is a lot more angular and more geometric. We do have the modeling and chiaroscuro, the semitones present at the right. They're absent at the left. We have the dog, symbol of fidelity, in the work at the right, at the foot of the bed or banquet. Whereas then the, at the left, it's been replaced by a black hissing cat. The woman at the right looking at us very shyly, giving us the sense of power. However, in the painting at the left, the woman in the painting has all the power as she's looking down at the viewer. Now, one of the things to keep in mind about the work at the right is that it is titled Venus. So it is almost as if we're masking the idea that she's a prostitute by using this allegorical idea of a goddess. And even in this one here by the artist Giorgione, we have more of a true goddess type of figure of the sleeping Venus. I want to show you a few other paintings by Manet and to show you what kind of a troublemaker this guy is and how much he's willing to change the idea of art. In Music in the Tweries, it's this great collection, this great ensemble of individuals, very individualized so we can identify who these people are. But look at what the artist has done with the landscape, with these trees. One of the few straight lines that we have in nature are tree trunks. They tend to be very vertical. But here he's twisting them, not only to the left, but also to the right. And here he takes our only true straight line in nature, that horizon line over the water, and he bends it down at either end. And in one of his later paintings, he doesn't even have a horizon line at all. He can't even possibly do linear perspective without that. He just eliminates it from the scene altogether. 
Manet was also friends with modernist writers, such as Emile Zola and Baudelaire. In the image of Zola at the left, I just want to draw your attention not just to the artist, but to the background. We have some heavy Japanese influences entering Europe at this time because trade with Japan has opened up. So we have this Japanese screen off to the left, a woodcut print off to the right, and also two other prints of famous paintings. One, of course, at the bottom being Olympia by Manet, but the other one by a Spanish artist, Velazquez, who gave us Las Meninas, except this work is Los Barachos, or The Drunkards. And this is also a name that you wouldn't want to call someone in Spain. It's okay to be a drunkard throughout Italy, throughout France, throughout Holland, but in Spain, it's looked at as a very much as an insult, being called a barachos. In this work here, um, with the races, Manet places us right in the middle of the racetrack with these horses bearing down at us, and it's really a cool painting. Whereas music in the Tweries had very identifiable people, here we just have splotches of color identifying the crowd. And now we're going to move on to the last masterpiece that Manet creates, called A Bar at the Folies Bergere. And it's a very popular image. It's really wonderful, as it shows a Paris nightclub. And we even have a trapeze artist in the upper left-hand corner of the image. The barmaid, her name is Susan. She is a real barmaid at the Folies Bergere, and she's staring at us, but definitely not focused on us. A very vacant look in her eyes, and the reflection of her and the rest of the bar is seen in the mirror behind her. In front of her, though, we do have this wonderful collection of still life imagery, from the flowers in the vase to the fruit, to the different bottles, and I want to call your attention to the bottles of champagne right next to the bottles of Bass Ale. And that represents the mixing of the social classes that happens here at this location. Sadly, Manet is going to pass away on April 30th, 1883, and just 16 days before that, he has a leg amputated. The last few months of his life, he spends mostly painting in a garden, and flowers were one of the things he absolutely loved to paint, and he created a lot of still lifes during those last few days, one of which is seen here. This is considered his last painting. One final note about Manet is his brother, Jean, ends up marrying one of the models that Manet uses, an artist in her own right, Berth Morisot, and they're going to have a daughter named Julie Manet, and Julie is going to go on to publish a diary of the times that she had when she was a kid growing up during the age of Impressionism. So it is a great book to check out, and with that, I'm going to end our discussion on Manet, and I will see you at the next lecture.